comprehensive approach to this. And in addition to giving you some information about sort of their um, their approach, I'll also introduce the, the lecturer um, and lead research uh, researcher who will be a part of the presentation today. So the Lagos Business School collaborated with SIPE and conducted their research on anti-corruption compliance, and they really sought to evaluate uh, the impact of the anti-corruption compliance training interventions in Nigeria, and they focused on looking at individual and company behavior and performance. Today, uh, we're going to hear about that research from Omowumi Oguyeme, who was a senior lecturer of philosophy and ethics and anthropology at the Institute of Humanities at the Pan Atlantic University. Um, she obtained her first degree in medicine and in surgery. She's highly accomplished. She has worked as a medical practitioner in various hospitals before pursuing a postgraduate studies in the humanities. She holds a licentiate degree and a doctorate in philosophy uh, from the Pontifical University of Holy Cross in Rome. And she currently heads the Anthropology and Ethics Unit and the Institute of Humanities at PAU. And she also teaches business ethics sessions at the Lagos Business School. Uh, so I will turn it over to you. We call uh, Omawumi Mali. So Mali, if that's okay with you, I'll turn things over to you to present. Um, and next slide, please, Dan. Thank you very much, Michelle, for the for the introduction. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here um, after the whole year of work on, on the project. And um, uh, as Michelle said, I work at the Pan-Atlantic University. And the, the research we did was basically domiciled from the Lagos Business School. And um, what I'm going to do is to um, tell you a, a bit about our work. I have just 10 minutes, so I'm going to try to speak a bit slowly and see how much of my our work I can show to you. The first is that it's titled Numbers and Words, Investigating the Effectiveness of Anti-Corruption Training in Nigeria. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about, uh, give a bit of introduction, our background, the design and the method, and the a few results and recommendations um, we got from the work. So next slide. The first thing I'm going to do is to introduce to you um, the, the, the team, because even though I'm the only person you're seeing right now, there are five of us working on this project. The team lead is Kemi Ogunyemi. She's an associate professor of business ethics at Lagos Business School. And she's here with us, even though I'm the one presenting. I'm the team co-lead. And working with us was director of the Institute of Humanities, Dr. Adara Onaga. She's also here. Uh, Chibweze Clinton was working as a research associate at Lagos Business School. At that time, right now, he's a PhD candidate in the UK. Akuna Osa Edo was also on the team, um, working effectively with us, uh, taking care of a lot of administrative work and also very much involved in the research. So this team, as you can see, we were all in Lagos and we were living um, the everyday experiences of um, hearing um, about news, hearing news and allegations of fraud, um, corrupt practices, both in the public and private sector. So it's something we hear about every day and it's not really new to us. So um, in addition to that, we have um, worsening um, corruption indices uh, from Transparency International for the country. And it was um, quite alarming to, to think, well, with all the um, ethics education that goes on in, in the country, um, is it, and the training's been effective. So we're really glad to partner with SITE and GBSN on this project, and then to see, um, to find ways in which we can check the effectiveness of, of training and see how much impact it's been having. Next slide. So the, 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 the uh, design and the method, you can click again, <laughs> thank you, Dan, um, is explanatory sequential, which means we started with having surveys um, questionnaires sent out to participants who have undergone anti-corruption training. And then based on that, we developed um, interviews to get more insight and like more in-depth information, more narratives that helped us to understand the information we had gotten from the, um, from the surveys. And we also had focus group discussions. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, so our questions we asked, were um, basically uh, four questions. Uh, Dan, could you please click 
and so the first was look at the contextual factors that that made the um, that could influence the effects of anti-corruption training. And then also we looked at relational factors. Then we also looked at the emotional um, components, the emotional drivers of corruption. Uh, could you please click the, the slides? The, one more, so I just have all four. And then we talked about the dominant uh, emotions. And then we talked about um, ways in which trying to find um, what Michelle said about trying to figure out how the anti-corruption training really um, works, so how it mediates the, the uh, the, the effective and how, how what makes it effective next slide please so we had a few hypotheses the first that you had things like um exposures to international standards um modeling or exemplary behavior by trainers as those con um, constructs that could um that, that would facilitate or uh, increase the impact of such training we also thought with regards to relational factors support from family from colleagues the culture within the organizations that these would be things that would be affected and the third hypothesis where there were five dominant emotional factors um basically uh, because of our context we didn't want to look at the usual um emotions that had been done in other studies for example guilt but we wanted something that well the people um, here could also speak to that is not um, there's a bit different that enriches the, the 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 studies we had before from literature. So we looked at greed, a fear of poverty, uh, peer pressure or desire for acceptance, despair of a different narrative. When you you think you can't beat them, then you join them, and then sometimes also a fear for personal safety and life as emotions that could um, influence or could could could. Um, affect the effectiveness of the training. And the, the third thing is that the, the how, we um, have the hypothesis that developing a strong personality is one of the ways in which you can, um, the, that the training actually makes um, its impact. And by strong personality, we described it as someone who is disciplined, ethically sound and lawful. So in the, the um, questionnaires, for example, we had questions dating to that checking um, the lawfulness and uh, in, in intentionality of actions and, um, and that helped us to um, check our hypothesis. Next slide, please. So like I explained before, the, met the methodology was a mixed method. We had both the quantitative phase with, with questionnaires, the qualitative, and they built on each other. So it wasn't two different studies, it was very much connected and that gave us deeper insights and, and clearer narratives to help us understand things better. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, just a few uh, ideas and results. We're um, excited to, to discover that the, the, the trainings were effective. Um, the quantity results gave us um, that, that with clarity. And then we now, uh, with the qualitative dimension, we're able to ask more questions as to why we weren't seeing the effects um, so much, why, so why there was still so much news of corruption and what else could be done to improve those trainings so that we have more impact. So I'll, I'll give you a few uh, examples from the results. Ne next slide, please. So from the hypothesis we had, um, the international exposure to international standards of, of training, of maintaining um, um, integrity and frequency of corruption training, having more frequent trainings and exemplary um, supervisors had both a joint and um, individual um, positive effect or predictive influence on the effective of corruption training, which means that with this um, construct, um, the, the anti-corruption training was more effective. And also, um, next next point, please. The, also, the the relational context with the the hypothesis on relational um, influence, organizational support, family support, and and um, those factors relating with human interactions also have that joint predictive influence and singular individual um, predictive predictive influence. Next next slide, please. This is something. Obuwami, uh, you are on mute. Okay, thank you Perfect. for that. So the the um, image you see here, the, the graph just shows the rankings of some of, of the participants of the questionnaires on the effect of the emotional driver, of greed as an emotional driver. And in fact, um, as you'll see in the very next slide, greed was the, the most um, cited or the highest ranked of all the of all the emotions that we checked, followed by uh, peer pressure or a desire to, you know, um, feel at par with one's peers, and then the least ranked was uh, 
anger at current injustices with fear of harm, despair of a different narrative falling in between uh, in the range. So the next slide, please. I have pictorial representation here on this next slide of the, of the emotional drivers. And this is how it, you see it a bit more graphically. And it's interesting to see that, although we got this rankings from the questionnaires, when we had the qualitative discussions, we discovered that there were more insights. For example, um, when it talks about fear, it was, um, we're pleased to have, you know, um, qualified the fear we, we talked about when we did the, 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 the surveys, because um, fear of consequences, of corrupt practices was actually a deterrent of um, of of corrupt of corrupt practices afterwards. So it, it, it worked both ways. If you had fear of just fear as as a construct, then it could have been confusing. But because of the way we separated the the content of fear, it was clear that when you talked about fear of um, harm of poverty, um, these were things that um, were drivers of corruption. But when people knew the consequences, they were afraid of the consequences, that that was a deterrent. So I'll tell you a bit now about the results. Um, could you please go to the next slide? Uh, sorry, a few quotes rather. So you um, you get a, like an insight to what happened also in the qualitative um, side. So the 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 respondents of the focus descriptions and interviews. Um, highlighted that we needed to have a start, um, the fight for corruption from the start. So you needed bosses and leaders who would show good example. And um, uh, also um, when it comes to the trainings themselves, the participants, a good number of the participants talked about having examples, case discussions, and ideas that you could connect with. So it was beyond just the theory. They were very much interested in knowing um, how this related to them. It gave them clarity on what was the responsibility when they were in difficult um, dilemma or, or in situations um, that called for them to make decisions um, that fight corruption, even in, in, in um, difficult environments. So the next slide. So I'm, I'm rounding up now with a few um, recommendations that or conclusions that we had. So we confirmed our hypothesis and, and um, this one of the important drivers for corrupt practices was actually agreed, one of the strongest. And then we, we also got um, uh, observed that even though the, the corruption level um, was still high, the other things that participants suggested could help, for example, having solid regulatory policies that are crafted and they're well enforced. So you may have the policies that are not being enforced. The other thing was people needed to know um, that there are consequences to, to, or they needed to also know the policies themselves to have guidelines in organizations and firms and to make it clear to everybody. Uh, in addition to that, ne next point, please. Um, um, if, if, if we put into consideration all the findings we have, the, the hypothesis we have adopted, these are things that could enrich the trainings themselves. Um, we, we also, um, from the discussions with the, with the, with the participant uh, realized that we needed more frequent trainings and follow-ups after the trainings, which sometimes could be um, included. You can click on the slide, could be, you can have follow-up after the training so that the people can, um, you know, do not forget what they learned in the trainings and also education at all levels in terms of responsibility for, um, as a responsible citizen, things to avoid and things to do. Uh, the participants really were, were keen on having people do that and teach people at all levels from young, from very young age about what it means to be a responsible citizen, to be, to live, have integrity, to avoid corrupt practices, have clarity in, in that form of education. So I'd like to end with just a, um, uh, a recommendation. Could you please go to the next slide? The, the last slide. Could you please speak? Thank you. That anti corruption training is, is not just a one time event. Um, it's something that everybody is also involved in. It's not just a one time event, it's not just one sector. It's, it's, uh, it's something we're all involved in. And that effort is going to yield um, some fruits in promoting ethical behavior and accountability. And um, please click. We'll, um, I'd like to say thank you very much for GBSN and thank you also site for the collaboration and for being part of that journey and thank you everyone here also being part of the journey to reduce the level of corruption globally and um, I'll hand, hand over back to Michelle now for the next speaker. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Molly. I appreciate one that you uh, helped move through your slides because I know we have a little bit of a time crunch. So I appreciate you moving through your slides. I, I know how it is as a presenter. Um, I want to say that one of the things that I'd like to point out to everyone, and I think this is essential to, I think the work that you do as an educational institution and also to an organization like SIPE, we understand that sort of addressing the issue of anti-corruption uh, can't sort of be a one-time engagement with anyone. Um, we're thinking specifically in the context of um, businesses or enterprises. Um, and what we usually talk about is creating a culture of, of integrity, creating cultures of transparency. And I think this is something that I found very interesting about the LDS um, uh, research is that your research very much pointed to this as the solution, creating that culture, creating a constant sort of pings and reminder about this, uh, about this issue specifically. So I want everyone to sort of hold that in their mind and remember that as we start to listen to presentations from uh, Gajah Mada University. Um, they were also funded and collaborated with GBSN and SIPE. Uh, they conducted, again, research that sought to evaluate the extent that anti-corruption uh, trainings could promote business compliance and could prevent uh, corruption among business professionals in Indonesia. Um, our presenter today will be Rima Ron, who was the head of economics fac faculty in economics and business at Gajah Mada. Uh, he earned his PhD in economics from the University of York in the UK. His studies investigate um, the mental map of judges and prosecutors for corruption cases. And he has uh, really actually just, he serves as a, an expert in Indonesia, most recently serving as an expert on a very, I think, high level and high profile um, corruption case. If uh, He sent us the link to that. So if someone on our team wouldn't mind dropping that into um, into the chat, that would be great. And you can see a little bit about the sort of work that he's engaged in. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it right on over to you, Rima Wan, uh, so that we can hear from you as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, our presentation. And uh, with me, um, Wuri Handayani is with me uh, at the moment. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, so this is the, the one that we want to discuss later on. Uh, next, next one. Okay, so this is a debate in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, literature, in economics, especially when we talk about, you know, uh, uh, green uh, sand wheel hypothesis and also the Chris the wheel uh, hypothesis. So the problem is that we have is the, you know, although many countries have signed the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, but then the implementation is quite very, and especially for Indonesia, it's, uh, we only uh, implement 58% uh, of the uh, recommendation. Next. Okay, so this is the research question that we have, you know, what are the motivation and challenge, and also uh, we're trying to see the uh, mental map uh, of the participant from the firm, in terms of the corruption prevention uh, corpo in corporation. Uh, next. Okay, so this is the situation that I discussed uh, previously. So um, we signed the uh, um, UNCAC in 2003, Malaysia signed in 2008, but in 2018, uh, Malaysia has already have the anti-corruption uh, agenda for the uh, private sector, whereas for us, we haven't done this as yet. Next. Okay, so this is the situation that we have. So 59% uh, uh, of the corruption in Indonesia has been uh, attributed by the uh, private sector. And if we see the court decision, uh, this is based on our database, you can see uh, how lenient actually the, 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 uh, the, uh, what is that, the, convict, uh, the conviction from the, from, from the court itself. It's, uh, this is related to a private corporation. Next. Okay, again, uh, let, next. So we use the uh, Zaltman uh, metaphor elicitation technique, basically. So we use the exploratory uh, research uh, uh, studies in this case. Next, so we're focusing on the corruption prevention program, but then the way we try to uh, choose the, the uh, subject is based on the, uh, the, their participation on uh, uh, training, uh, anti-corruption training. And we, thanks to uh, KPK who give us the list of the uh, corporation that in, involved in their, uh, uh, that participate in their uh, training. So we contact them 
uh, already. So this is the situation that we give the, uh, what is that? We give a briefing for the first uh, phase and then the second phase, we uh, have a deep discussion with them. Next. Okay, so we have a 10 step of the Zaltman metaphor elicitation technique uh, interview. Next. Next, please. Yeah, so this is the participant. Okay, uh, go to the result, please. Yes, so this is the situation. So basically, you know, after the, we're trying to compile the, uh, uh, what is it, the mental map. So this is the consolidated mental map. So in, in one side, we have a corruptor. On the other side, we have a eradicator that actually they, they all have uh, some kind of, a, you know, the construct that they have is almost uh, similar. But the, the question is that, you know, uh, who will be more adamant and who will be more uh, committed in, in dealing with, with, you know, this, uh, either that's uh, for the corruption or the, the intervention itself. Now, this one is not only occur in, within the, the, capi, the, the corporation, but also uh, outside of the corporation as well. So we can see um, now in uh, 2014 and 2019, uh, internationally, we are very good in terms of the, uh, what is that uh, anti-corruption program? But uh, since 1920, uh, 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 it's downfall, and now we have um, the the lowest um, the lowest situation in Indonesia, especially for the anti-corruption uh, movement, because the government uh, doesn't have um, uh, strength uh, any longer uh, to maintain the, the the what is that their their spirit in dealing with the corruption. Now this this will be similar to the what we find in in our uh, study uh, that uh, to some extent within the within the uh, uh, company the corruptor is actually more you know they, they work in more organized way whereas the eradicator it, it has uh, some kind of a you know they 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 are not as accommodated as the as the other side of the of the coin basically so this is the situation that we have okay next. Uh, this is the, you know, some of the uh, things that we have is so that's part of the performance expectancy, effort expectancy, facilitating condition, and also a social influence. Next. Okay, now this is the situation that we have. Okay, so here I, I, I want to make a, a slightly alteration. It's actually it's not infinitely repeated zero sum game, but infinitely repeated uh, inspection game. It, it ha only has... Um, mixed strategy as equilibrium, but then the problem is that if you're trying to play in an infinitely way, this is not uh, an easy way. So it's, it's just like a pendulum, actually. So the construct is just, you know, it's about the performance expectancy, ex uh, effort expectancy, facilitating condition, social influence, uh, cost, and also uh, personal uh, factors. Let's go to the uh, some of the findings that we have next. Okay, so this is the, uh, usually, in terms of the personal factor, we have some religiosity, geontic perspective, uh, but at the same time, we also have the denial uh, of the problem, denial of the responsibility, and also the effectiveness, and also the anticipatory emotion, uh, lifestyle, uh, extravagant of uh, sometimes a lavish uh, lifestyle that uh, uh, attributable to the uh, all of the problem that we have. Next. Okay, so this is uh, some anecdotes that uh, we have for the performance of the uh, expectancy. It is very interesting to see that even some state-owned enterprise, which is uh, that they are monopolized, they still use the anti-corruption uh, prevention program. Uh, why? Because they're trying to neutralize the conspiracy theory. So this is this is very interesting to see that uh, although they don't have a um, uh, competitor, but they still need to have to build their reputation because that will make their life easier when that's uh, so uh, what is that serving uh, people. And then uh, also sometimes they 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 put quite a uh, tough message to the vendors, especially now when they talk to the vendors. This is usually either they can do the training or they, sometimes they do uh, training to staff and also to the vendors. Uh, to those who did uh, training to the vendors, usually they already have uh, ISO uh, 37001. Next. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, next, another one, please. Sorry. Next one. Okay, so this is a, and at, at some point we also have, you know, we found that there is a complexity in tackling uh, some uh, corruption. Um, so one of the uh, uh, 
participant not said that in any attempt to prove the corruption create risk to us and our family. The threat can be both physical or non-physical. That is probably quite interesting to see, you know, from a different uh, perspective uh, regarding this. And also the perception about the bureaucrats, how they deal with the bureaucrats, they said, you know, when uh, by the time the subject uh, interact with the bureaucrats, the old habit of the bureaucrats hasn't uh, diminished. And sometimes they also say that, you know, this is the anti-corruption thing or the reformation that we have, it's just like a turtle wearing a rapid mask. Next. Well, probably I can go, uh, uh, this is the facilitating uh, condition. Yeah, so, um, and also the uh, some impact in terms of the asymmetric uh, measures, because the what, what I discussed before, I said before that, you know, in some of the measures, uh, we um, tend to be biased towards the public, uh, public company, but we are quite loose uh, towards the private company. So it's one of the uh, participants said it's better to say sorry than ask permit if you work in the private sector, but you cannot do that in a, in a, in a public company. Uh, let's go to the uh, directly to the uh, uh, conclusion, please. Okay, so this is okay. Okay, so. What we have, what we found here is the interaction between corruptor and eradicator uh, within the corruption, within the corporation and beyond, it may be modeled as an infinitely repeated uh, inspection game. So, of course, it's both player actively uh, seeking the strategies, but then at the moment, what we see in Indonesia is the, that the perpetrator is more uh, uh, adamant and they are more organized rather than the eradicator now uh, we need to work you know that is one message that we need to convey is that that the eradicator has to work uh, collaboratively why because the uh, perpetrator tend to work collaboratively as well and they are more adamant rather than the eradicator so further study that we would like to do is uh, we trying to conduct a survey a base and then we de uh, design the questionnaire based on the uh, result that we have from this study thank you Back to you, uh, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramon. I think one of the things that's really interesting about your research is you point to something that um, the team uh, that an LBS sort of pointed out is that there's there's something about the pattern of interaction in between individuals and sort of how we think of this. Um, it's not just at an institutional level, it's also really at the individual level. And then the what I found fascinating about your research was thinking about the context that people are thinking about these issues in, which is, of course, the whole point of this research. So uh, very well done. Thank you so much. Um, I and now I'm going to move us on to our Q&A session. So I want to thank Molly and I want to thank Rimawan for great uh, presentations. I know that other members of your research team are here. And so uh, for those individuals who are here, if you don't mind, if there's something you'd like to add to the conversation, please feel free to, you know, unmute yourself and answer. And for everyone else who is here, our guests, please go ahead and pop your questions into the chat. Um, or if you feel comfortable, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, happy to see you, um, you know, turn on your camera, uh, have a little bit of interactiveness here. Um, so I will first um, ask if there are, um, I do see some questions <laughs> immediately from Kemi, who I am I'm not surprised by that. For those of you, um, I think Molly already highlighted for us that Kemi was uh, uh, also working on the team with LBS. She's a really wonderful researcher. She's very well accomplished as well. Um, and we had a, it was a delight to work with her. So Kemi, if you don't mind, I'm going to start off with your question to kick us off. So thank you so much for that. Um, I will, um, um, read her question. She says, thank you so much for the presentation. Could you please throw some more light on the personal factors of corruptor and eradicator uh, that was on the slide? So she wants to hear a little bit more uh, from you, Rima Wan, and from your team on sort of what those factors were for the corruptor and the eradicator. That was something that I found interesting as well. So over to you. Okay, so that's uh, for the uh, that kind of the, the the question. Now, this is a very interesting. Some of the uh, participant also uh, said that actually a family can be can be the the driving factor of the corruption. So they they talk about the lifestyle, but then at the same time they also give a, some sort of like a pressure as well to the to the uh, to the staff. Uh, sometimes they 
envy to other uh, to the neighbor, for instance, you know, with, with certain uh, lifestyle, and they they request it too much to some extent. Now, this is this is some of the uh, problem that they face, and also because Indonesia is vast, and some of the some of the uh, people sometimes they have to to work in other in other island. Now, uh, some of the participants they they already have. The, some indicator. If if you work in another island and you don't uh, return to your family within three months, then they force you to return to their 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 their, their family. Why? Because if something that's very interesting to make you, your life is interesting outside of your family, then there is a possibility that you have a, a you joy in that, then that will force you to do some corruption as well. So this is a, this is a, some interesting thing that they that we found, and also there is a. In terms of the eradicator, they're trying to shift the, the, the idea to the religious values. They, they said, you know, that you know, when you work in here, okay, you work in this company, you're not only working, but that's also how to be a, a good people, a good, a good individual. And they, they remind us, uh, they remind about the, you know, life after, after death and, and et cetera. And then uh, the day of the judgment, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's part of the, uh, because in Indonesia, people are very, uh, quite religious and they usually they use the religious values in terms of you know trying to to promote the anti-corruption uh, thank you for that uh Rima Wan. i uh, apologies i forgot to mention that we'll be moderating the q a session uh dan and myself so dan will also um ask questions and maybe ask you to raise your hands as well um i see a comment from kemi uh sort of uh, reacting to some of the things that Rima Wan has said. I wonder if Molly or Kemi have anything that they sort of wanted to bring up and to sort of add to this. I'd love to hear a little bit of sort of cross <laughs> conversation, but maybe Kemi, you're someplace where you may not be able to unmute, but would love to hear from you if you if you are, because you've got questions. I see them in the chat. Yeah. Can I add uh, one more? Michelle? Sure, go right ahead. Go right ahead. I can't see who's talking, but Jeff, please go right ahead. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to add what Rimawan has already mentioned. So during the interview, our participants, mostly they mentioned the uh, corruption from the fraud triangle, right? From the pressure and then from the opportunity and the rationalization. So when they explain uh, uh, the experience of pressure they mentioned uh, many example as uh, rimawan just uh, explained there are many uh, reason for example from the family reason from the pressure from the peer and so on this is the some of the reason that make the the pressure however uh, even they have such kind of pressure they also have um, uh, some you know uh, uh, counterparts of the pressure, uh, as mentioned, from the religiosity or spirituality. So they always remind that uh, there there is some uh, life after death uh, be belief. Yeah. So if they remind this kind of uh, thing, then they are trying to reduce the uh, pressure that uh, make the frauds within the uh, company. So I, I think um, this is my uh, at explanation from what Rimawan just mentioned. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for adding on to that, this element of pressure. Um, so I'll turn it back over and say and ask um, Kemi, well, maybe if you had something you wanted to ask. Um, I also see, um, but I'm thinking perhaps not, but I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Dan. I think he's got what I would call a question face and I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> I can tell uh, I you're have, at the, have, on the edge of wanting I to have, ask. <laughs> I have a bunch of question face, but I, I also see that Lola has her hand up. And I have many, many opportunities to ask questions as we work with the group. But I want to turn to Lola. Uh, Lola, you you uh, have your hand up. There you are. Nice to see you, Lola. Same here. Thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone. And um, thank you so much, uh, GBSN. Uh, and the ACGC for uh, putting this together and for the research team, to the research team as well. Thank you so much. Um, great job. 
interesting findings. And um, my question is about, is about the, I'm just looking at it here, the, the motivations that uh, LBS found in, in Nigeria. It, it's already telling a lot of stories. So I have two questions and I'll be really interested in seeing if, um, if the research that you did in Indonesia speaks to this as well. Uh, the first question is the fear of um, let me just pull it up. The fear of the of impact on if if you have the um, if you have the slide and you can put it up that would help. But just right after greed and peer pressure, those two indicators right there, I didn't really understand. I don't understand how the respondents understand what that question is, and I'll be curious to understand those motivations more. I'm gonna pull it up um, on my screen. So it's right after greed and um, and uh, peer pressure, um, respondents responded that a motivation was fear, not fear, uh, fear of poverty, I think. Um, just give me a second. There we go, right there, yes. Fear of harm and uh, fear of harm to personal safety and life. Um, is this was this a case of extortion? Is uh, what does that mean? How does that motivate? How does that occur in the corporate setting um, for employees to feel compelled to engage in corrupt activity for fear of their personal safety and life? Are there, did you find that threats could be made in the con context of corporate setting? of a corporate setting. And then the other is the uh, despair from different narrative. If you could sort of just talk a little bit more about that, that's one question. The second question is, it's really interesting to see how high peer pressure scores on this chat um, as a motivation. And if you asked questions about whistleblower provisions or confidential reporting, um, um, strong protections for whistleblowers in, corp in corporations. If you did in the survey, did you find any patterns um, where companies that had whistleblower provisions, uh, probably on average, peer pressure was not as much of a problem um, in, in their corporate setting? So th those, those two questions uh, are separate things, but I'd just be curious to know how much you found from the study. Thank you so much, Lola. Um... Let me try and answer a bit. <laughs> okay, so about the those two in the middle, the fear of harm, yes, in the corporate sector, that does occur. Um, I'm drawing not only, I mean, in this conversation now, not only from the survey the, and the interviews themselves, but also from my experience of teaching uh, executives in the Nigerian space over the past, like, 12 years. So yes, people sometimes feel that they have a threat to their personal safety if they don't do what they have been asked to do. Sometimes, or should I say most of the time, it's a matter of the hierarchy within the organization. So yes, the, the fear that, it, that seems to affect them more may be the fear for losing their jobs, uh, which, is a, which is not personal safety. But especially when they're interacting with um, people who are already uh, doing similar things that are already engaged in corruption, there is also that element of something can actually happen to me if I don't just join uh, the same, uh, if I don't follow the trend, if I don't do what everybody else is doing. So if, for example, you have a contract, uh, a public sector contract that the organization is meant to get, and there's a cut that is normally given, you're not going to want to rock the boat because everybody's looking at you. Are you, are you, are you likely to be a whistleblower? I mean, that's, it's a threat to them. That is more than just that you don't want to participate. So if people will just leave you alone, as in you don't want to participate, you don't want to get rich quickly, and they would leave you be, it would be something. But people actually do feel that it won't stop at that, that something will happen to them. Uh, so we saw that, but it's not as high as greed, yes. Uh, the despair of a different narrative is the, if you can't beat them, join them thing. Like people feel 
this is the way things are done here. If I don't do it, the competition will do it. If uh, this is how it, people will say, if do you really think I would get the contract if I only bid exactly uh, what I would have bid without offering an incentive? Because other people within the same industry, they can do exactly what I can do. So it's not that I want to bribe in this case. It's not like I, I want to give you a bribe to get a job, but I think there's no other way to actually show that my quality is different or my way of doing things is unique and that the people should do what I, I want. Uh, they should take, they should select me instead. So they think that there is no other uh, way to do that business. So we have a lot of people that that's the reason why they do what they do. And um, uh, mostly we get a, a deeper sense of those things from the interviews than from the survey itself, because the survey is not broken down. From the survey, we have we explain to them what this means so that they know when they're responding, what exactly uh, those constructs mean. And then your second question was about whether companies that have whistleblowing uh, regimes that are secure are different. We didn't actually ask about that, so we can't speak about it. However, practically all the companies we went to are uh, larger corporates because they're really the ones that do the whistle uh, that do the anti-corruption training. So most of them would have, at least uh, nominally, whistleblowing. Um, protection, at least nominally. The question is how they work in reality. And I'm not so sure about that because, because of precisely, it looks like there's no link between the questions, but there is a link because of the fear factor. If really the whistleblowing policies work very well and people were not concerned and were not worried about the backlash of revealing what's going on, then we would have more people saying, oh, this is really what goes on in this company. But no, we don't get a lot of uh, people actually speaking up. So they, they felt, people felt comfortable to participate in, the, in this research because we uh, talked a lot about confidentiality, you will not be identified, etc. So, but other than that, I, I'm not sure they would have been so frank about how they felt. But we didn't ask about whistleblowing specifically. Thank you so much, Kemi. That was very helpful. Um, Michelle, um, no, I think we're uh, close to running out of time here, and we still have uh, a couple of hands. Up. How do you how do you want to handle this? So um, let's go. I see. I see David. Uh, well, he was saying goodbye. I thought. Uh, so and Lola, <laughs> I will lower your hand. But I see Dr. Sorba, apologies uh, if I had not pronounced Sorab. your name properly. But Sorab, thank you, Dan. Uh, I, do you have a question if you'd like to unmute and ask your question? And then we'll move on to some questions from the chat. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity of asking my uh, question. And this is the first time I have been to, uh, uh, to this GBSN webinar and I really liked it a lot. I really enjoyed it a lot. Now, uh, my questions uh, to the presenters, or oh, I must say that awesome presentations, learned a lot. Now, uh, one factor uh, which is uh, very much unique in the societies of South Asian countries like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and that factor is the uh, factor of social customs, which is very much responsible uh, for giving birth to corruption. Uh, the factor is that it's it's more specifically, if I say, it's more specifically related to the marriage of a daughter. Uh, you'll be, I don't know how you will react in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan. Generally, uh, there is something called we say that is called dowry system. Once mm -hmm. the girl gets married, uh, the girl's father, the girl's family will have to give a sum of money which is equal to ten to twelve times of the yearly salary or the yearly, most, mostly it's yearly salary of the uh, boy's income. 
so i think you can uh, think of it so if it comes to around some 10 lakh rupees per annum so it will come to around 1 crore rupees as dowry which needs to be paid now whenever a father whenever in indian society a daughter uh, takes birth the uh, artificially socially the father gets under pressure that i'll have to earn a lot just to mm. get my daughter uh, get married so uh, have in the studies have you factored in uh, social customs because i am sure social customs is very much there in african countries as well as in indonesia and malaysia so what's your view on it thank you Okay, uh, thank you. This is a very uh, good question. Uh, we found several uh, issues regarding the, the uh, cultural the, the cultural things, because like in, in Indonesia, for instance, it is a custom to give somebody, uh, we, we provide a gift. Yeah, and this one is, um, uh, the, the problem is that the, when the gift is come from, uh, what is that, a customer, th this will be a problematic. Now, uh, apparently there are some uh, different measures in here between the private company, private bank, for instance, although all of the banks in Indonesia is, are highly regulated, but for the private bank, they allow to, to, to give, uh, to, to accept the gift. We call it as actually gratification, uh, but they, they accept it uh, if that's uh, after the transaction. But for the multinational corporation and, uh, and also the state-owned enterprise, it is forbidden to accept anything. So they, they, they have to, they will accept it, but then, because they, they don't want to, to uh, what is that, to, to harm uh, other, uh, you know, the, the customer feeling, but they have to report it to the certain section and then they, they send it to uh, KPK or Anti-Corruption uh, Committee in Indonesia. So this is the, the measure is like this and, and the way, and, and they also need to acknowledge that you not you know it's it's better not to refuse because it's if if it is refusing the the what is that the gift it's just some sort of like uh, offended at the, the 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 customer but actually customer is happy to do that so this is this is a problem that we we encounter especially for the uh, that kind of uh, uh, cultural things probably Wuri would like to add some more on that point please yes sure okay. thank you very much for the question. Um, the the the, uh, the question reminds me of one of the conversations we had in the focus group discussions because we're um, talking about the the influences and um, of culture of um, one's context uh, on 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 the knowledge or really the awareness of what really is acceptable and what is not and I remember um, some of the conversations were, were such that what, at least one or two of the participants actually pointed out that there are some things that are cultural customs that they would have thought were acceptable but following the trainings they were able to identify that these subtle gifts favors to family that were expected were actually corrupt practices something so I think in that light um, with, with the with the trainings that the people had, they could see that the trainings helped them to be able to, you know, differentiate between what really is a gift, something that is customary, and what really is unethical. And that really um, also um, was important to know because then the companies also need to make it clear what the practices should be like, and then uh, what, what exactly are the standards. Like you mentioned, the limits. Uh, either in terms of the monetary value of gifts that are acceptable and the procedures that one should take if one is offered a gift based on something that ordinarily may have been seen as culturally, ac culturally acceptable. So I think that really um, came in in the conversations and the qualitative aspect of, of, the, of, the, of the research. And it, it's, it's really impressive that some people pointed out that the trainings helped them to actually have clarity in understanding what really should be acceptable as something culturally okay and something that really is a corrupt practice. Thank you. Hey, this is this is great. We have a lot of discussion going, and um, um, I want to uh, interject with a question that was posed in the chat earlier. So, David Capadalupo from uh, MIT in uh, in Massachusetts in the U.S. and I think. He may have had to leave the meeting, but I think it's worth exploring the question. And that is, how useful is the media as a strategic wow. tool when it comes to anti-corruption um, training and development? In fact, it, you know, I think it's it's perhaps also useful to think about the question more generally because I, I noticed in both presentations there's a there's this um, 
there's an interest in the role of the context or the environment and um, how that shapes the effectiveness of uh, anti-corruption training. Who wants to start, um, Molly? Uh, okay, uh, yeah. okay that, that, that's fine, I could, I could start. Okay, um, one of the recommendations or the, the, the ideas that came from the focus group discussions what, was the need to have um, a widespread awareness of what corruption really is, the damages it has to society, and to initiate trainings or awareness on responsible citizenships from the grassroots level, as in speak to everybody, get everybody involved and make sure everybody's aware. And interestingly, one of the media that was suggested was even to make radio jingles, make sure everybody knows that the media is aware and, and try and make it something that everybody hears every day and they're very much interested. So in that sense, um, the media has a key role to play because also because at some point, um, the, the conversations uh, show that people uh, learn a lot from what they hear from the media. And, and uh, it would be a very um, interesting way also to keep the, the the trainings, uh, the not just to formal settings, but then to see uh, how to keep the awareness broad. Um, I see that Kemi has her hand, hand up. I think she may want to add to what I'm saying uh, before the one. Or... Thank you. Yes, if I may. So uh, the media as a strategic tool, I'm assuming that uh, it would, we will be talking about a policy direction for the government or are we talking about the organizations as the corporate organization because the media is at the macro level so that being said yes the media can actually make a lot of difference um, in Nigeria we have a lot of uh, impacts uh, from the media on the way people think and I think I think that over time, the emphasis in the media has been on getting rich quickly. In Nigeria, we call it hammering. You know, you need to hammer. And when you think that you need to hammer, it's not really about hard work. It's about finding a, a quick way to do it. And we do also have messages that are, that are anti-corruption from the media, but they're not very, very common. Uh, and they're not very prominent. Uh, I know that uh, Accountability Lab has been trying to make a difference in that space in Nigeria. They've been funding people to produce music that is anti-corruption, for example, that promotes integrity. And I hope that we will soon be, be caring more of that. I only know because I get their newsletters. I'm not sure that it's something that is actually making a, a very huge impact yet. But I think, yes, it's important because before the election, the current uh, election process that we're in, there was a, a music video that came out of the main musicians in Nigeria asking people not to sell their votes, trying to, in advance, preempt the level of corruption that would come, uh, that, that could happen over this phase. And many people loved the music. I think it was probably probably for too short a period to make a real difference to habits that people would have already had. But at the same time, I'm sure it made a difference to a number of people just because people follow these musicians and they, they really, really uh, listen to what they have to say. And these are the people that will not have access to the kind of anti-corruption training that we're talking about that the people in the formal uh, corporate sector may have, especially the bigger com companies. And of course, we need a change that is holistic, not only just in the in the private sector. So yes, I think media can be used as a strategic tool because partly because a lot of danger also comes from the narrative that people find in the media. So that's a really great. Thank you so much for that, Kemi, and for answering that question. I wonder if anyone else um, from Wimawan, I see you are muted, yes. so please go right ahead. Yeah. Uh... It is in, in our there, there is a in our finding it is very interesting to see. There's one of the uh, participants said that uh, the if we see any um, 
uh, top management from a multinational corporation or you know other other company uh, caught in a, a corruption case that will be as considered as a, our early warning system so it's, it's giving like a, a signal to us that we need to be to be to be careful with this now uh, recently the, the the problem that we have it's not only on the the media the the conventional media but now which one is most uh, uh, powerful is actually twitter um, we found that uh, it's, it's, it, it, it can drive the, the, the whole uh, idea of, of, of the, the anti-corruption agenda. At the moment, it's very, uh, nowadays, for instance, in, a, in the last, in this week, for instance, we have a very uh, strong uh, messages, especially because that was, uh, uh, there was a, pro, uh, what is it, a, a crime that has been committed by the son of a, a staff from the Ministry of uh, 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 finance and the Ministry of Finance is, is is very he is very rich and then now the the the, the netizen uh, the uh, people in uh, uh, Twitter trying to upload you know check the 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 wealth and and etc you know all of the uh, what is in a, in a, in the internet they they put it upwards and and, and they're trying to refill it to uh, to uh, to to create the the uh, the pressure. Uh, uh, Wuri, probably you, you would like to add some more, please. Yeah, I, I remember one of our participants also mentioned and uh, explained that the most scary uh, for them is if there was a news in the media, any media that uh, uh, reported uh, their company. So there was one of experience where uh, the company was uh, complained by, by customers and then there was uh, some big issue. Um, and then because of the uh, news in the media, and then they trying to solve the issue and find out how to, you know, how to reduce and how to uh, eliminate the issue has become the big issue. So I think, yes, uh, media is very uh, useful and strategic for how to uh, tool. Uh, how to eliminate the corruption. So I think uh, customer and um, I think uh, stakeholders can you know raise the issue through the media, particularly to the social media that must be responded by uh, many companies. It's become the uh, red flag for the company right now for the media. Thank you. Now, this is a really wonderful and rich sort of discussion about this. Um, one of the things that you'll often hear me talk about, um, I'm sure my colleagues at Type have heard me say this, is that we have to have holistic, which is exactly the word that Kimmy used, approach to sort of thinking about anti-corruption. We, of course, are, you know, focused a bit more on the private sector, but of course, uh, you have to have layers, right? The media, um, SIPE also works with children, making sure that there is inclusion in terms of all of the communities, uh, such as women of uh, different indigenous communities are pulled into this sort of discussion about what is corruption, right? And how do we sort of move the needle a little bit um, and, and and sort of create an ecosystem, I would call it, of integrity, transparency. Um, this is all sort of really important. And it speaks to the fact of what we've seen in some of the research, right? There are many different levels to making sure that we're addressing uh, addressing the issue. Um, Dan, I have another question from the chat, but which I can go to from one of our, um, our, our actually our most recent Sussex intern. So if you'd like to think of it as our new Jackman, uh, which is of course uh, is Reese who uh, is joining us. He's a current, uh, Sipes current Sussex intern. We're really glad to have him at the event today. And I'm gonna go ahead and read your question, uh, which is on the idea of lifestyle to pressure for corruption. Um, may I ask if it's mainly from family or society or from the media? So maybe a little bit more, we've been talking, I think, in depth about this idea of pressure. We've talked about the harm. We've connected that to whistleblowing. We've talked about uh, peer pressure, but Reese is asking, are there other dynamics that we might be interested in knowing about in there? Is it family? Is it society? Okay, uh, in, in 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 our case, it's it's all of them actually. You know, uh, first from from the family, uh, and also from the society, and also last thing is about the you know the the existence of the Instagram. Um, when when people uh, show their lifestyle, uh, they go abroad, for instance, in 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 uh, you know just for traveling and that kind of stuff. That's create a pressure uh, to the to the 
uh, to some some other stuff. No, that's why it, like in a in a banking uh, industry, usually they, they they use what I call uh, know your employees. Um, they know uh, and they have um, sort of like 360, 360 degrees of the surveillance in, in the sense that uh, not only from the from the top manager but also from the peer also uh, monitoring uh, each other, especially for the uh, uh, what is that the the lifestyle. Uh, they're also trying to uh, control uh, particularly uh, the the behavior of the spouse because in many occasions the spouse may be the the driving force uh, for the for this uh, pressure yes uh, i fully agree with rima one it's a, a lot is coming from the from the family but uh, it's not just uh, the family apart from the person is the whole family unit because they sort of build up um, a particular way of living and then nobody wants to drop that uh, summer holiday or the mm. shopping in particular places. So even if one realizes after a while that you know this is not really the right way to fund this lifestyle, then they don't want to go back to what, what was in many places, in many cases. So that happens. Because somebody would say, how would I go back and tell my wife that we, we're no longer going to have <laughs> two cars or we're not, yeah. we're not going, to, we're going to. So, but it's not just the wife, it's, it's actually uh, the the two, because there are also wives doing that. I don't think is that they are free to tell their husband anything, <laughs> but it's a, a kind of complicity that we we want to mm. send our children to this kind of schools. We want to have this kind of life. We want to uh, to be like the other people that we're comparing ourselves to. And so, these are the the things that come out as greed in our research, because it's not that these are poor people, it's just that they've set themselves some kind of uh, targeted kind of lifestyle that they want to cling to, and then they want to keep having more and more and more. This has been amazing. I'm listening to the, the conversation, the questions, the, the responses, and I think one overarching conclusion we could all make is that it's very complicated, right? It's complex. Right? And that it's not a simple question about doing more training. It's about doing um, training, but also thinking about all the factors that lead into that and support that and complement that. And Michelle, gut check. I know we're supposed to end at uh, 9.20. I have a half a dozen questions that I've been anxious to ask, but can follow up afterwards. <laughs> um, um, do we draw it to a close? Yeah. What, how do we handle this, Michelle? Yeah. Nikki, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if we could have one closeout question from Dan, that will probably put us right at time if everybody's okay with that. So Dan, I know that you have questions, <laughs> so I, I want to hear from you, so please yeah, go well, right ahead. Let's. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I'm, I'm going to save a few to. because, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to save a few. I, I was, um, let me just give you a hint that some of the things I've been thinking about throughout the experience is that I remember uh, in the beginning, we, we talked about corruption is uh, not new in Nigeria, right? This was, I think, a statement, Molly, you made right at the beginning. And I think, Rima Wan, you said something like the public sector, the government has sort of given up, right? And, you know, so one question I would have asked has to do with, you know, how do we deal with this um, idea that perhaps we feel like we're powerless, right? That there's this helplessness in dealing with such a, a pervasive issue in our uh, countries. But I won't ask that. The another question I had had to do with this idea of Rima Wan. You, by the time you were done, I felt like uh, any single person in an organization, it could be either uh, Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde. Right. And that yeah. there's only a fine line that separates them, which <laughs> triggers me a lot of questions about, you know, how do we how do we nudge in many ways people, not just train them, but nudge people in a direction that is more positive rather than negative. But the question I, I do want to ask is, is, is I think a lot more straightforward in, in many ways, but 
And the idea that um, education happens, we, I, I talked about effectiveness and I talked about access, right? But mm. if you were to think about this question of access, um, my assumption is that most of you, when you're thinking about your research, was thinking, were thinking about face-to-face -face programs, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Mike, and sometimes we think of them as the either or, either we're face to face or we're online. But my question is, what have you learned that might suggest opportunities for us to do more and better online? Um, you know, things that we might be able to do that scale a little bit more effectively. Um, you know, now that we have stronger technology access. So uh, hopefully that's a, a question you can answer in less than, well, minus two minutes since we're supposed to uh, finish a little while ago, but uh, please, uh, Rimuan, uh, okay. uh, Mali, either one, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we can do that. I think that would be much easier to do the, the online one and then uh, using also the, the, the questionnaire uh, that you need to fulfill to, to answer after the, after the training. So in a sense that if supposedly that you have like five stages of the videos uh, talking about the anti-corruption and then from uh, one uh, stage to the next then you have to reach like 70 percent of the uh, question should be answered right for instance now another thing that we can we, we found as well in in our research is that uh, the the role of the digitalization uh, some of the company they, they're trying to even trying to do a continuous uh, audit for instance and using using the using the ai for the uh, audit so this is this is very interesting to 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 pursue actually because we use the the technology. But the downside is that uh, please be in, especially in the Indonesian context in that is that uh, please be careful with the with, with people sometimes using uh, digitalization term is quite abusive. That actually what they do is not the digitalization; it's just only electronification. So it's in the sense that they just change from the from a hard copy to the to the PDF and then they call it as a digitalization but it's not the digital itself. So if we can move towards the digital process itself with using the AI, I think there are so many things that we can do, uh, especially to prevent the, the corruption. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just jump in. With, I think it's a fantastic idea to consider um, increasing access by using online resources. Um, especially for um, people in a corporate setting. Uh, it will be more difficult to reach people outside um, that mm -hmm. setting. You don't have access to those resources to connect online. But if, if the because one of the things we we saw is that is helpful is supervisor modeling. If at least um, the supervisor levels they have access to those courses and somehow if it's fitted into their programs maybe in appraisals and they're able to have access to it with a lot of flexibility maybe that would increase also the reach um, and building on what Rimwan yeah. said and, and <coughs> suggest from Dan, I think it would go a long way um, to increase access if we could have those kind of courses after all there are people who do take online courses for several other um, topics of interest and having those courses online in an engaging mood uh, would help a lot. That's great. And, you know, thinking about those uh, factors that um, mediate, as you say, that support or hinder uh, um, compliance, education and training and how the digital could affect that. That's great. Um, you know, what great opportunities you've articulated through your research and um, Michelle, I, I appreciate your indulgence in letting me finally ask <laughs> no, uh, you, uh, a you, question, you. but I know we, <laughs> we have to wrap it up and I turn it back to you and Nikki to wrap it up. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. It's been really great to co-host this with you and of course the process all along the way with uh, Rima Wan, Wuri, uh, Kemi, Molly. Um, so thank you also to our participants for being here. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Nikki to sort of wrap things up for us, but thank you everyone. Wonderful. Uh, interaction here. Yes, thank you all for an excellent discussion and for you know being present here. This uh, event that you saw today here was a culmination of our projects. 
Um, we would like to take this opportunity to thank all the teams that made it possible. As a quick, um, we also want to make sure that we're thanking all the attendees today, both internally from SIPE and also externally. We really appreciated hearing all your thoughts and questions. We will be sending over the two research teams' papers that further detail their studies and findings, as well as the slides and the recording from today's presentation to all the event by registrants to your emails. Um, I know that was a question that was asked in the chat, so just wanted to highlight that again. Again, thank you all for attending today and for your time. We really appreciated hearing from you all.